I'm going to introduce you to Phil Gibby, who is Director of Arts Council South West and has been such a great supporter of Southampton, of the bid, of the council, um, of the creative community here. Um, so please give a very warm welcome for our last speaker, Phil Gibby. <laughs> to let the cat out of the bag. I am between you and the drinks and I'm, I'm extremely uh, uh, aware of this fact. Um, I, uh, nice to see everyone. Um, I, I stand before you here not so much as the great and the good as the, uh, think of me more of the, the willing but limited, I suppose. I, that, that's the slot I'm uh, aiming to occupy here. Um, those of you who know me know, know that I'm a relatively sort of gloomy person by day-to-day by -day disposition, but actually I'm going to play against type here because I am here to radiate optimism about this city and about this subregion and about the opportunity that lies ahead. Um, there are a couple of, of technical challenges with, 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 with the speech that I'm about to give. I had, I had really high hopes for this speech and I sort of, I put a lot more care and attention into it than I often do. I often just throw up a few slides and, and sort of riff on those. But then sort of about halfway through the day, I thought, well, do you know what? Everything I was going to say has already been said more eloquently by other people in other sessions. So I thought, well, actually what I'll do is just play a bit of that back instead. And then that last panel brilliantly played back all the incredibly good things that people said, which I had hoped to incorporate in my speech. So uh, I'm now going back to, to doing the speech whilst trying to splice that with some of my favourite quotes of the day. Um, so, so in summary, anything might happen. Um, and, and I apologise uh, in advance as well for the scandalous misquoting and uh, terrifying paraphrasing that I've uh, brought to some of the things that, that people said earlier on in the day. Um, I'd like to start actually by um, sort of taking on one of the phrases that has become common parlance over the course of this event, the ring of shit, right? <laughs> so there's a book, um, and I can't remember the name of this, was it, was it Charles Cooley who wrote the book called The Looking Glass Self in about 1902, a, a sort of a masterpiece of, of psychology of the time. And, and the notion of the looking glass self is essentially for anyone who hasn't read it, the idea is that broadly, um, you know, sort of if somebody says to you, oh, you don't look very well, then you suddenly start thinking, oh, maybe I'm ill, actually. Uh, and, and that's why, to be honest, I think notions like the ring of shit are really, really dangerous. There was a book about 20 years ago called Shit Towns. I don't think that was a very helpful thing for an awful lot of places as they began their place-making journeys. So, so please don't um, walk away thinking of this city as having a fantastic cultural quarter and then a ring of shit around it. Think of this place as a city of a quarter of a million people of untapped and potentially unlimited cultural potential because that's what Southampton is. Um, <laughs> Right, um, so, so, so this presentation um, picks up actually on, on, on something that, that Mikey Martins very helpfully said in one of the sessions a little bit earlier on. And, and, and you know, the, the, the proposition I think I'm bringing you here really is that probably the best thing you can do with a city of culture bid of the type that you've developed over the last couple of years is to make the most fantastic bid possible, to engage your city as deeply and as comprehensively as you possibly can and then to not win it. Because if you don't win it, you have already built the partnerships. You are all talking to each other. You have got conversations. You have got ambition. And by not winning, you have an unlimited timescale against which you can deliver that. You can make generational change. You're not going to have to squeeze it all into 12 months time, in, into a 12 month period of events with a very, very short lead in planning time. You are going to do this on your own terms now. And I think that is the best thing that could possibly happen. So um, in, this, in this presentation, sort of, I'm, I'm going to try and amalgamate these things. I think I said some reflections on, on, on the discussions we've had earlier today and, and, and a list of absolutely compelling reasons why Southampton is now a cultural powerhouse poised to sweep all before it for a generation. Um, and, and, and this is just 10, 10, 10 slides and I'll, I'll just, uh, as I promised not to do, ramble around each of those a little bit. So. Um, Firstly, in, in terms of um, terrible photographies, or quite a lot of photography is just me uh, on my iPhone just picking up things 
over the last two or three years as I've, I've been around the city, there are some obviously better photographs by real photographers which get spliced in with everything. But the, the first point I think I really want to make is, is, is the notion that the, the 2025 bid gave the residents of this city an opportunity to see Southampton with fresh eyes. I think it, it, it enabled perhaps um, the largest, broadest and most open conversation this city has ever had with itself. Thousands of people took part, whether that was in consultation workshops or working groups or, or participating in surveys. And, and, and what we understood from that, if I've got the data right, is out of every 10 citizens in Southampton, uh, at least eight of them felt that making this bid was of incredible importance to this city. And, and I, th I think the only possible conclusion we can draw from that is uh, from Bargate to Bitten, from Shirley to Sholing, there are about a quarter of a million people right on your doorstep who are giving you permission to continue this conversation. Um, second thing I'd, I'd, I'd really like to talk about, I suppose, is the idea that, that Southampton's talent pipeline is, is flowing. And this, co this comes with caveats, of course. So uh, we know, to our shame, and, and John, John Newbegin articulated this earlier, that the talent is everywhere, opportunity is not argument. Um, we know that the uh, national talent pipeline that feeds the culture and creative industries tends not to be representative of, of the demographics of the UK and not even close to that. And, and we've known that for a generation and we haven't changed the game on it. And I, I think that's a real shame. I, th I think we heard Leon earlier in the, uh, the children and young people session talking about children and young people feeling let down all the time. I think the, the um, point that, that Kate uh, played back from, from that session as well. It's not so much about how you get invited to a table as whether or not you need the table, giving yourself permission to make your own furniture, I suppose. All, all of that feels really vital if we're going to get the talent pipeline flowing. And, and I think in Southampton, I can see something stirring. So if you look at those people who were partnering in the bids and some of the conversations that took place, um, you know, th th there is potentially visionary work taking place or waiting to be unleashed inside your schools, outside your schools, in further education, in higher education, all of those organisations, I should probably stop doing that, I do apologise, um, but all of those um, quadrants of the education sector, of, of those who work with children and young people, are making decisive steps forward to getting that type, talent pipeline going. I think the idea of um, working towards UNICEF uh, child-friendly city status is, is, is another incredibly important part of that. And again, it's always in, in, in conversations like this in places that have made bids for City of Cultures, appreciating what on, is on your doorstep is, is a vital thing. And in arts work, I think you have got a nationally significant organisation you know, sort of inspired by the spirit of Ken Robinson and, and, and with a reach that resonates far, far beyond uh, this city, um, the ability to translate the hope, the optimism and the ambition of children and young people into tangible career pathways. Not every city has that. You have. The bid's given you uh, the opportunity to have the conversations, I think. And, you know, it, I suppose at the heart of it, what we're saying is that, that here we've got um, an opportunity for children and young people to be change makers who shape the creative and cultural industries in Southampton on their own terms. For a generation to come and that's probably the biggest prize of all you, you can always throw up a shiny building you can't hold open the doors for an extraordinary generation of talent to come through not everywhere not all the time you've got that opportunity um i i, I wonder just as a passing thing i saw on slido earlier on the, the notion of um uh, should there be a youth board or something like that for um sort of engaging children and young people with uh, with culture in southampton again don't get too hung up on structures. Find, find the right, listen well and find the right way. Don't, don't, don't create a structure just for the sake of having a structure, I suppose. Um, so I'm optimistic on, 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 on talent. Another thing I think the bidding process did incredibly well, it proved that the city region is alive and whether you, whether you call yourselves, um, I don't know, the Southampton city region, the, the central south, whether you, whether you are South Hampshire, urban South Hampshire, whether you are, you know, sort of the Solent Corridor, whatever you want to be, um, I, I think there is a, a, a real critical mass of opportunity beyond the city as well as within the city. Um, I checked some Arts Council spreadsheets before I came here today because that's the sort of thing I do. Um, and it appears that since the start of 2022, so in, in little more than 12 months, um, 
Arts Council England's committed something like £23.2 million of new investment into to the Southampton and the, and the wider Solent area, which is, um, you know, might be small beer for some. For us, that's a really significant commitment. We've put £2.5 million, pounds, somebody mentioned the Isle of Wight um, earlier. We are super optimistic about the Isle of Wight. I, th I think it is uh, like Southampton, just across the hands across the Solent moment. I think there, there is equal opportunity over there as there is over here. So we've put £2.5 million pounds into the transformation of ride through the Cultural Development Fund. Um, we've, we've talked about it earlier today, about putting one and a half million into Southampton through our place partnership funds. We put a million pounds about a year ago into the New Forest through our Creative People and Places Fund. And uh, over the next three years, cultural organisations across Southampton and, and, and the wider sort of Southampton area will benefit from uh, about 18 million pounds of funding through our National Portfolio Programme, which is about five and a bit million pounds more than we've ever invested in the area before in that sort of period. Uh, and I don't think that's job done. I'm not going to come here and, and stand up and sort of complacently say, well, well, you know, thanks and, and good luck. That's the down payment. We're going to build on that. And I, I think there are places in the Solent where we have scarcely begun the conversation. We've scarcely begun to invest. We have responsibility to those places. And there are places where we do invest already, but where the talent floodgates are about to burst open. And we need to be ready for those moments of opportunity as well. How are we going to measure the success that we see in this part of, uh, part of England? I think we'll probably do it in three ways, I suppose. I think, um, uh, number one, uh, what impact and what opportunity for children and young people is realised? That's really important to us. Um, the strength of communities is a vital measure to us. Uh, and, and, and thirdly, I suppose, it, you know, making sure that investment drives a return in terms of jobs growth, economic growth, all of those agendas. I think... What, what do they say about the creative and cultural industries? It's the third or fourth um, fastest growing sector in the UK economy. I think somebody said earlier that Southampton is the third fastest growing city economy anywhere in the UK. Bringing all of that together feels like another moment of significant potential. Um, your nighttime economy is really beginning to step forward. And I've, got, I've got some challenges on, on, on how to push that further, I think. So we, we know that the cultural venues around Guildhall Square and elsewhere, we know... Um, you know, the eating and drinking around Oxford Street or, you know, sort of if you're fondly imagining new uh, futures for the waterfront, which I strongly, strongly consider you to do because what, what an opportunity your waterfront is. What an opportunity that is. Um, they don't have that in Birmingham. Um, but, you know, sort of I, I think all the pieces are gradually coming together uh, to build the nighttime economy and, 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 and really make this city sing. So there's an organisation called the Burns Owen Partnership, they're a consultancy, and, and, and they, a couple of years ago, introduced the notion of a nighttime economy index, and it's got five principal areas in it. Um, audience and participation, cultural and retail assets, an enabling environment, urban attractiveness, and leadership. Uh, and I suppose the question I'd like to put to you is, what are the nudges that you can make as a city that maximise the potential of your nighttime economy? What are the... Um, economic opportunities that arise from just making those simple shifts it's like if the bus buses run an hour later what does that mean what is the benefit do, in terms of we, we talked about people feeling safe and secure the nighttime economy when the nighttime economy flourishes crime quite often drops what what, what are the interdependencies and opportunities that we see around that and whose desks sit on so you know does southampton need a nightmare which is the sort of fashionable thing that you get in many different places I, i'm I'm hearing that laughter, and, 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 you, and you get that in a lot of places. Or are all of you collectively going to take responsibility for growing and optimising your nighttime economy? Because I think that is an opportunity right there in front of you. Um, the networks you've established are going to sustain you, and it, it's the great strength. I, I think I, I've heard a lot today about, you know, or we could be co communicated better within this way or that way or the other way. Actually... The way you've come together as a city over the last sort of 12 to 18 months is the envy of other places in the south of England. I, I think you are beginning to develop incredibly powerful networks. And I, I, I'd like to really reference the business community in particular here, whether it's um, Paris Smith or Associated British Ports or West Quay, Southampton Airport, Go Southampton, or all of the business um, support for this bid has been fantastic. And you don't see that in every location. That has been a real singular strength that I'm seeing Southampton as having at the moment that other places don't have. Um, ten local authorities from across the wider Solent area all stood up for this bid. bid. They all invested in it. And from an Arts Council England uh, context, we are committed to all of those authorities and making sure they get a return 
on the journey they've taken. Uh, and then that, that wide, wide range of, of, of people who participate in the bids because they took part in working groups or, or other aspects of it, whether it's um, West Itchen Community Trust, Skate, Southampton, Alma Road Medical Centre, Richard Taunton College, Spitfire Makers, Charitable Trust. There were a lot of voices heard in that bid and all of those voices will be needed as the city goes forward. Um, you know, in t speaking as a representative of an arm's length body that works in support of wider public policy agendas that aren't just about arts and culture all the time, we see you, we hear you, and we're committed to taking those conversations forward with you. Um, running out of time. This is a sitting of outstanding leaders. It's always extremely embarrassing when a number of people in your slide are actually then in the room and looking at themselves on the screen. So we'll gloss through this quite quickly. But I, I think, you know, that thing Alan Lane said earlier on is like, how do you give away the power but retain the responsibility? How do you grow a new generation of leaders? You know, sort of as somebody said, what happens if we have this conference again in 12 months time? Well, in five or 10 years time, perhaps none of us who have been on the platform today will be speaking at a conference in five or 10 years time because we've got the succession planning rate, we've identified the talent, we've held the doors open, we've sent the elevator back down and this city will be sustaining and replenishing itself in terms of leadership. Um, I think you've got cultural organisations to be proud of. There, there are, when I encourage people to come to Southampton these days, there are far more things I can point them towards or encourage them to do than they can ever possibly do in a day or a weekend these days. And, and you know, that is a, just a small group of incredibly good cultural organisations in this city. Um, just, just, I think, again, keep sending that elevator back down. So if you're fortunate enough to be in receipt of national portfolio status, who are the organisations you're going to support and mentor and encourage so that they're better placed to be supported by the Arts Council or Southampton City Council or others in future? Um, if you're an organisation that isn't regularly funded, what, what are the things that we can do to give you confidence to fulfil your ambitions? Let's have those conversations. Because again, you know, sort of, everybody used to say in the South, didn't they, that it was like, oh, it's Bristol and Brighton are the big cultural cities. And it's like, well, between those two places geographically, there is a really, really significant challenger brand, which is coming right through to um, force itself into the middle of that conversation. And you are that place. Um, You've got a plan, you've got a, you've got a bid, which you'll be seeing next week, apparently. Um, and, and we are committed as a partner to the city long term, as I know so many other um, public bodies are. We're, we're all taking this journey. Culture is writ large in your corporate plan. I think that's really, really important. I see a, a bringing together of culture with so many uh, environmental strategies, health strategies, education strategies. Culture's always there in Southampton. It's really, really valuable. Um, I think you're on the map, you know that, you don't need me to tell you that, but, but you know, sort of that, that journey, the partnerships you've built, everybody's looking at Southampton uh, and, and I think everybody sort of is on the outside peering curiously in at the moment. They, 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 they want a piece of this and I think that's the, the, the growth potential of the relationships you can build and the work you do is going to be really, really important to you. Um, Journey, not an event that goes on forever, that's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? But, but, it, but it's true, and, and that's why I think not having to condense it all into the 12 months of 2025 is a massive advantage from your point of view. Um, and yeah, just get out there and own it and challenge us. Don't, don't, don't you know, sit here and, and smile nicely when, when people from Quangos get up and say, you're doing very well. Challenge us to take that journey with you to fulfil your individual and collective ambitions for the next generation. Um, there's a guy called uh, Dmitry Hegerman, who uh, some of you may or may not, I, I'm really interested in complicated electronic music, and uh, he's the, sort of, my, I often described as like the godfather of the Berlin and Detroit techno scenes, which is, does him a terrible injustice because he's a community activist and a brilliant placemaker. Uh, and he often does sort of speeches like this in, in, in events like this. Uh, and, and he's got a little mantra which he always brings to, to these sorts of situations, which is, you know, the, the one that you see there and, and I, I think that's excellent advice and everyone should take it but also write your own mantra tell your own story have one as a city have your individual reados and, and, and uh, over how you make places better and stronger because you know the opportunity is right in front of you and, and um, Zest Collective who I, I think are absolutely fantastic did that amazing sort of installation on the mezzanine earlier with all the coloured bricks and, and, and the, the conversations about um values and so forth and they had six values out there um there's a seventh value which i think you have absolutely got by the bucket load and, and Satvia um 
invoked it earlier on in, in her speech. And, and, you know, the two-word piece of advice to leave you with, I think, if, if nothing else, is simply, apart from building on what you are doing and continue to take this journey, um, remain authentic because you are, and it is an absolute trump card for the work that you're doing. Thank you very much.